Welcome everyone. Uh, this is Rich Berliner from Connected Real Estate and we're here today going to talk about landlord driven private LTE using CBRS, but we're going to wait one more minute to let everyone load in and then we'll begin the webinar. Good morning, good afternoon, everyone, wherever you may be listening to us today and watching. Uh, I'm Rich Berliner from Fifth Gen Media and Connected Real Estate Magazine. Uh, welcome to our webinar today, Landlord Driven Private LTE Using CBRS. Uh, so before we get started, let me explain what we're doing and why we're doing it this way. So um, I first want to thank John from Onyx Equities, John Schultz from Onyx Equity, who is the co-founder and managing principal. Um, John called me uh, a number of months ago asking specific questions about CBRS. And we spoke a little bit about it. And after that experience, I realized that landlords have a great deal that they want to know about private LTE and CBRS. So what that conversation spawned was this webinar, uh, bringing together John to ask the questions and an esteemed panel of experts to answer his questions. So. John, I thank you very much for teeing this up because it all came from your uh, giant brain. And uh, thank you for all of the rest of the panelists who are our sponsors today. Uh, Brendan Delaney from a ANS Advanced Network Services, Orrin Binder from Ongo or the CBR, formerly known as the CBRS Alliance, and Jim Jacobellis from Geoverse. Thank you all for being here. So John, um, just a couple of housekeeping items before we start the uh, um, the webinar itself. Um, we're going to take questions from the field and please, if you have a question, uh, we'll do everything we can to answer them. But if you have a question, uh, please, please feel free just to use the uh, go to webinar uh, panel and you can ask your questions and they will be re relayed uh, to me. Um, we are recording this and we'll publish this within a few days and everyone who signed up will get a copy of the recording here, um, including we'll put a link to uh, a new uh, uh, piece that Oren and his organization, the Ongo Alliance, has put out called CBRS for Dummies, which I think is a very worthwhile piece to read. And if you'd like more information, you can go to Connected RE Mag or the websites of our sponsors, uh, ANS, Ongo Alliance, and Geoverse. Uh, so, John, the floor is yours. Please feel free. And thank you again for coming up with this. <clears throat> well, thanks for having me. This is terrific. You know, I wish this wasn't on uh, Zoom or go to webinar, but it is. And hopefully next year we're doing things like this in person. I can't tell you how much I miss that. But here we are. And, and what an amazing turnout. Uh, also, what a great panel. I mean, I've met all of you and knowledgeable and i really believe these are the right people to actually navigate through this seminar so we actually have real take-home value technology moves fast it's complicated and if you look at what COVID has done it has amplified what technology is going to have to be in buildings both on mobility health and wellness and all the new amenities that we're going to have to think about uh, to try to bring people back into these buildings and be be successful. So Oren, I'm, I'm going to start with you. So anyone who knows me knows I cannot stand acronyms because I got to go look them up on Google when people are talking to me and I don't want to have to do that. So my first question to you is what is CBRS? What does it mean? And is it a technology? Is it something else? G give us a feel for what this new technology or service or what you're going to say can offer to the landlord. Okay, I'll try to give you my best answer without using acronyms um, after we get rid of CBRS. But CBRS is Citizen Band uh, Radio Service. That's a name given it by the government. And, and let's get straight into it, what it is and, and why really people should care about it. 
And bottom line, it is, it's a new opportunity for property owners to have their own high-performing, secure, private wireless network. And, and where is this coming from? Why is this new? And, and like, where did this land from? Basically, the government identified a large chunk of, large chunk of premium mid-band spectrum that was uh, originally allocated to the DoD. Um, and years ago, they used to, like 40, 50 years ago, they used to throw large chunks of spectrum to different entities. And so they took this mid-band spectrum, gave it off to the DOD, and the military was using it. But today, they're extremely underutilizing it. They're not even using like a half a percent of, of all this spectrum, this valuable spectrum that's out there. So what they decided to do, instead of bumping them off the spectrum and then throwing it over the fence of the highest bidder, which they do sometimes, the, the FCC, they decided in this case to drive innovation and make it available to everyone. They literally called it the innovation band. Um, and th what it does basically it gives property owners the opportunity to have their own 4G and 5G private networks without needing to actually buy spectrum. Um, just to give a sense of, of when, when I keep talking about spectrum and mid-band spectrum, the adjacent spectrum, which is called the C-band, and it's not exactly equivalent, it's a little bit more and you could use it for higher power, but it was just recently weeks ago au auctioned off for over $80 billion to the operators mostly. So that's just to give you a taste of how how uh, valuable again this this mid-band spectrum is, and we'll get into 4G and 5G in a little bit when we talk to, to the other people and myself here. But but again, just to get a taste of how this asset is is this kind of very valuable asset is now being made available basically to everyone without needing to to basically pay for it to buy the spectrum itself. So, so and so could yeah. I just clarify something there? So so that means sure. I own a building and my is it associated with my address like you're saying it's out there is it attached to my building what do you mean so by free so that's out? where the ecosystem comes in and that's where it kind of differentiates it's not licensed spectrum which is what you get today from from operators but it's also not unlicensed where anybody can go buy a wi-fi access point slap it on the wall and basically get wi-fi access it's lightly licensed from a mechanism that basically um, a spectrum access system that allocates the spectrum once you put the equipment in, in your building. Uh, and that's all coordinated and Brendan and, and Jim will get into that a little bit of examples, but that's basically all coordinated in the background by the equipment you put in your building. So once you put that in, you basically have access to all this premium spectrum. Wow, 80 billion, I, I read about that, it, it's incredible the amount of money that goes into this. And finally, landlords are getting a, a free perk somehow. Usually we're giving those away, especially in this market, but we'll have to see how that goes. So Jim, you're up. So I have access to this, right? So all the owners now have access. You know, how does it work? How do you pay for it? You know, how do I actually make it something tangible and real? Yeah, so the I think to piggyback off of what Oren just said, um this is this is a this is a new thing in the US for for landlords for tenants for property managers to be able to get access to the type of spectrum that will allow you to do LTE and 5G previously you got access to spectrum that allowed you to do Wi-Fi allowed you to do Zigbee Z-Wave and stuff like that but but that sandbox where you can do LTE and 5G was previously reserved for the cellular carriers and people that bought licenses. So you you now have, and you're not you're not paying a fee to operate on this band, a, a significant chunk of spectrum to do really fast, reliable things. Um, that as of January 20, previous to January 2020, wasn't available to you. So it's free. Now, what why does that matter? Um, it matters for a lot of reasons. So if you compare, you know, what you were able to do before with Wi-Fi, um, you're talking about a more secure, significantly more secure wireless methodology, significantly um, more reliable um, wireless experience, a significantly uh, better way to cover your building. So you, your, um, your coverage footprint increases dramatically and then because of all this, um, not only does it make your smartphones and your tablets uh, perform better, but business critical applications such as video, 
Um, I think ESG monitoring is a big thing right now. Connecting EV charging stations, robotic, VR headsets, all this stuff works better uh, because of this available spectrum that you can place a platform on. So basically, you know, I'm trying to put this in landlord speak now, you know, you guys are doing a good job. It's more secure. It's vaster for my building, right? It allows me to actually be a little bit more in control since it's 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 on site and it's our network. It allows me to open up to do multiple things that I would have to deal with with more outside parties, right? Am I correct or not? You are correct. And unlike doing something where you may have a VPN connection to a public cellular carrier, you get to keep the data here. So this data is your data because it's private. Well, what I love about this, you know, especially with all the cyber issues, I mean, every day we're, we're hearing and reading about hacks uh, from all over the world. And you know, tenants worry about that. And us as building owners want to make sure we can offer the highest level of it. And, you know, what I'm going to talk about with uh, our next uh, panelist, esteemed panelist, Brendan, and look at me, put, he put a sport coat on. Look at, look at this guy. He's ready <laughs> to go. I love it. But, you know, with IoT, BMS, data, data, I mean, there, there's so much we have to deal with today because if you look at what I think this epidemic did, pandemic did is create not only the large companies to be in the cloud, but every company now is going to be in the cloud. So with all these sensors and data and all the issues that uh, we have to address, Brendan, so what will it actually do for my building? How do I make a tenant feel that I'm in front of this and that mm -hmm. I'm actually servicing their needs other than what I normally do, which you can order food, you know, I clean, I clean, clean the building, all, all the stuff that, you know, we've been doing for years. Well, I, I think leapfrogging off what you brought up, John, about security and Jim, what you talked about in terms of, of the, the quality of the network, it really, previous to this, that LTE or the ability to, to have an LTE network of your own, that was the, the realm of the carriers. So really it gives you access to a carrier grade type of network and uh, that you can have in your building. And those, you mentioned IoT, building management systems, all those things that are really prime targets for a lot of the cyber uh, attacks that are, that are out there because they're unmanaged devices. It's not like uh, where you have, have your phone, you have your laptop, that's typically a managed client on your, on your IT network. Uh, th this is something where you can extend a, a secure way to connect to those devices with your infrastructure inside the building. So it's a functional way to extend your network, whether you're in a building, a uh, part of a facility, a campus, with high speed and secure connectivity out to these endpoints. So, so what we've done with it, we've connected uh, digital signage, We've connected uh, video from, from in, in these brownfield type of environments where it's an existing building. So if, if you're going to be putting up a, a new um, kiosk for entering the building, we, we uh, at our headquarters, which is a multi-tenant uh, office and, and uh, uh, warehousing facility, we have intelligent human body monitoring at the entrances. We were able to deploy that and backhaul it on the private LTE network without having to deploy new physical connectivity there because there was already power. We plugged right, it so in. So let's put that in landlord speak. You don't have to dig holes. You don't need extra wiring. I mean, like, see. see exactly. Your, your travel team vendor you is not going to be happy. Yeah. When you guys come in, you're, you know, you're, you're saying this, but I want people to really walk away with, like, why it matters. It makes it easier to deploy, right? Like, we're doing a gigantic renovation at the Gateway Center. We're putting digital, and this is in Newark. We're putting digital signage, wayfinding everywhere, right? This is an existing building. Like we would want it to be easier for us to not have to dig up the floors and do all the things that you normally had to do. Does this allow that to be an easier process? It, it does. And especially in, in a place like that where you have a lot of public facing events, you may have to manage people and pro people flowing through that space a lot different based on each event. You've probably got umpteen outlets spread throughout either the walls or the floors just to support all the existing cleaning and support structure that you have. 
now you can deploy that same digital signage on its own. Essentially, you keep things in your swim lanes. You can keep your Wi-Fi network open to your guests, support that connectivity that people look for, while keeping your business critical items on its LTE swim lane, secure, quality of service, because it's it's very much controlled environment, is guaranteed. So you have those business critical applications in a flexible deployment. So you can put it where you need it, when you need it, instead of having to dig up floors, run new conduit, get additional contractors in there. It can be as easy as your sports staff rolling the kiosk to where it needs to be today. Because it has the speed and it has the agility and you have more control. So that's what I want everyone to understand. EV chargers right now, electric vehicles. I mean, they're only going to get more. It's something Mm -hmm. we all care about and want to accomplish. How, How would that interplay? With the with the EV chargers, what would that allow it to do that uh, would make it beneficial to the tenant? Yeah, especially in major metropolitan areas where you've got a lot of uh, uh, subterranean subgrade parking. Instead of having to deploy new conduit and physical connectivity to these EV chargers, if you have your private LTE and your EV charger, make sure you have compatible modem in it. You're, you're off to the races without having to worry about a lot more pipe and conduit to get there. Uh, so, so occupancy monitoring with the IOT, that to me is something that tenants really care about today, especially, you know, when you go back to COVID, understanding who's in the building, where are they, we're going to be concerned about it for our common area amenities, like, you know, the, 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 the restaurants, all the stuff that we want to provide. So this will make it easier to control and easier to deploy. Correct. You put any of those devices or gateways in a convenient location and connected on your LTE network, it can save you a lot of time and and money deploying more physical infrastructure to get there. And Terrific. Brendan, just one other question to, to jump in. Um, somebody, I think Jim mentioned it before, but then you, ha- you own the data here. So if you were using an outside service, you'd have to potentially work through them if you wanted to check the data once a day, once every morning, or once every afternoon. But here you could check the data every 10 minutes if you wanted, because it's your data, you own it, and you can manage how often you look at it. Is that correct? Th- that's correct, and, and you can also keep what's your data on premise. You're not bouncing out to somebody else's data center, somebody else's switch, and then getting it back. So uh, just with commercial real estate bridging so many spaces, whether it's logistic or office bases, when you're looking at some of the use cases for automated uh, logistics and warehousing facilities, you want to have really good latency or really low latency in those locations. And you can keep that data on premise and process it on premise, keep it nice and quick and lean without, and then you only send out what needs to go out to the wider web to the wider web. So it gives John, a lot more. Maybe, maybe John and Rich, I can come with like a real life example, just picking backing off exactly what, what Brendan sure. was talking about. We, we had a vendor who has these uh, warehouse robot, robots. You've seen these things are kind of these freaky things that run through all the warehouse. They go up the shelves, they retrieve items, and and this is all becoming automated today. And basically, they had tens or sometimes more hundreds of robots in a huge warehouse running around simultaneously in motion. And they were had to be wirelessly connected, obviously. With uh, and they were using Wi-Fi was a non-starter here because of the the obviously the um, like Brenda said the latency and the amount of data there. But they were using proprietary expensive networks. But the the and the transfer data wasn't just about how to get the robot from X to location Y. It was also what's the inventory levels, what's the most efficient path to take. Um, and and they and the vendor was loading more and more data onto these robots to get better and better performance. But the the network started breaking, so they were looking for a better solution there. And now they're starting to deploy CBRS networks in these warehouses and putting the robots on CBRS networks on a on their own private network. They own the data. They're getting the performance. They're not paying a premium. And and again, just just one real life example of of how this could come to fruition. In, in a different example. Yeah, I, I mean, I, I don't remember the company, but I see those commercials where when you talk about latency, like they're trying to get an order out or check inventory while they're walking the warehouse and it was just, you know, not going fast enough. So, and th- the more that we automate with AI machine learning in these robots, the more you're gonna need this in my mind. Uh, and the same thing's gonna go for for buildings, right? And, and just how your amenities are, are used. So, so Oren, 
now that you, you sort of chimed in, I'm gonna stick with you. So is the plan for this to be able to also be used for voice? Because you, at the beginning you said, okay, have your LTE network for those things and have your Wi-Fi and voice for those things. H how does this come together eventually? And what's sort of the value proposition for it? So all the examples we talked about till now, everything that Brendan mentioned and Jim mentioned, myself with the robot, that these were all private networks, local networks um, that you build. And we didn't mention things also like laptops. Today I have laptops from Dell, HP, Lenovo. You have iPads that connect to CBRS. But again, all this is talking about using data within the building and on private networks. Once we talk about getting solar coverage, that would kind of be phase two. And 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 again, this you'd have to enable now connectivity to the operators. Now you need AT&T, Verizon, T-Mobile to get on board where you can, your customers, your tenants can walk into the building. Um, and I know, and we're hearing for customers that there's a ton of, of, of um, coverage issues, dead spots of cellular. And, and to be honest, Verizon or AT&T aren't gonna come, with all due respect to John, they're not gonna come into your building and solve it because it's just not there. There's thousands and thousands, tens of thousands of buildings. It's just not what they do. Um, and there's lead coverage um, on the windows that are bouncing off the macro. So we do know that indoor coverage is an issue. So CBRS will be able to, um, and again, this is separate from the private networks, but you'd also be able to use CBRS as a neutral host where you would basically go from your AT&T slash Verizon T-Mobile network onto the CBRS network, keep getting your service, keep getting five bars everywhere within the building, um, again, while connected to your network. But for that, you do need the operators to get on board. And, and technology-wise, that's something that is solvable today, and, and I've seen it work, but it is in process. Um, and, and I assume that Jim would have more to expand on this here. Yeah, Jim, I, I want to hear your view. I mean, at the end of the day, you know, nothing like this happens fast. So there are things we do today, but w where do you feel we are with the cell phone part? And and also, will this replace a DAS, right? I mean, if I'm get, like, wh where does this all go? And how does it expand? Because, you know, with most technology, as me being a fanatic, I, you know, most people only use 20% of what it offers anyway until they fully understand it. and they keep chipping away and then we use it all. So what, what's your thoughts on that? As far as phones, yeah, good, you know, good, where does it go? Good question. So uh, Geoverse is kind of in a relatively unique position in that we're, we're a top 10 cellular operator in the US. Um, and we have a pretty significant footprint mainly in the kind of the, the, the Western part of the US where we're in essence um, a roaming provider to the big three carriers now it used to be the big four. So we have we have this, these interconnect agreements, these roaming agreements and things like that. And because we made a strategic decision to share some of those resources for private use, um, landlord tenant use in their facilities, we're able to create uh, you know, an experience using this spectrum that we're all talking about for smartphones, whether it be Android, iPhone, uh, even tablets, doesn't matter, today. Um, and, and right now, I think you have to work in the, in the kind of the domain of, you know, it's available for, um, for, for your tenants and for the staff of the building. Um, the the visitor piece is is in testing. Um, There's several deployments where this is this is actually happening, but the the issue that's kind of preventing it from getting to mainstream is that uh, most folks that carry a smartphone carry an older smartphone, and they they don't have a smartphone that has this capability of this new band in it yet. But over time, two years from now, that will change to where there is a critical mass and kind of that same fabric that you're using for all this other stuff right now will be able to accommodate visitors coming in um, and using the network as Oren described as what we call a neutral host in the, in the industry. But I think you might call five bar service for visitors or something like that. Yeah, and like you gotta walk before you run with anything, right? So I've, I've been like trying to keep a list in my head, like I'm up to six of where I could use it right now in our buildings, right? Knowing 
as the phone cycle happens, we're offering something that will be more powerful, right? Bars, right? I don't want to ever be in the elevator again and lose someone on the phone, right? I hate that. Hopefully that will solve this. And I think it will actually. Uh, and then, you know, you're going to deploy it that way. But there's still so many other things that actually are so value uh, add before you get there, right? That's so right. it's sort of a long-term thing that uh, we've been given this opportunity to try and create. So it's it's sort of cool. Rich, just give us some of your color. I mean, listen, you, you've been around a long time. You know this stuff as well as anyone on this panel. G give us some of your color, right? Sure. Uh, yeah. Thanks, John. So the replacement cycle that Jim started down the path with is really the important thing here. So that means that, you know, if you're buying a new uh, iPhone 12, if you're buying a, you know, a new Android, all of those phones now, the Google Pixel phones, um, LG, all of those phones now carry the CBRS frequency in them. And, and as we go forward with the replacement cycle, you know, in this day and age, I don't know about you, but I don't think many people keep their phone for more than two or two and a half years. Um, a, the battery starts to wear down. B, I want the newest technology. C, there's some new feature, camera, whatever, that makes me want to go buy a new phone. And now they're, you know, they'll finance it. It goes with a package. But at the end of the day, as that cycle goes down and people replace those phones, more and more people will have CBRS in their phones and will wake up one day and it will be able to be used by visitors to your buildings because they've replaced their phone and it now has CBRS in it. So that's Sorry. that's my take on it. And it's you know, coming. I, I, listen, right. nothing was built in. Rome wasn't built in a day, as they say. Right. So I that's get right. it. So, uh, Rich, that makes actually Brendan. So there's two more questions I'm going to ask. I'm going to start with Brendan on this question. Then the most important question that every landlord always asks is, how much does this cost? What's my ROI? And make me feel like I need to do this, not just want to do this, right? I mean, at the end of the day. But, but Brendan, how do you actually get started with this private LTE network, right? Uh, you know, it's new. We can't just call Verizon or whoever we call, right, and say, please put this in. You know, how, how does this operate? So, it, it, and, and where it doesn't put so much strain that it's something that, you know, we don't want to do. Exactly. Well, I'm sure Verizon will be happy to sell you more SIMs, John. So rest assured, yeah. if you call them, they'll sell you something. They will. Um, but in terms of, of getting started, it, it's really, especially at a, at a change of use or an upgrade of a building or facility, it's a great place to start. And you reach out to, uh, anyone at the, the Ongo Alliance, uh, member companies like Geoverse or, or ANS, or, or folks like Rich who just know a ton of people in the industry, and, and you start talking about the challenges you have or what you're trying to do in your facility, and that way you can say, okay, you know what, I, I want to deploy uh, digital signage or, or enough connections where I can make my facility dynamic from a day-to-day -day basis. And you start there and say, okay, how much would it cost me to deploy that physical infrastructure versus putting a layer of your private LTE network in there from your radios that connect out to the devices you're going to have on the network, be it a kiosk, uh, camera, um, digital signage, wh whatever you want to put on that network, your, your EV charging stations. And you start to think about, this is my first, the, the, the toe is dip in the water. And from there, you start to realize this is what else we can put on the networks, whether it's your, your point of sale for vendors that are, that are coming in. It allows you to uh, to do things like be your own be your own service provider in your footprint. If you have seasonal kiosks, instead of having to, to put down a, a, a piece of copper to get them out there for their point of sale or, or have them try to be on the Wi-Fi and, and uh, have long transaction times, you can give them a handset, give them a tablet, let them run the point of sale over your network and just get a bigger piece other than just the real estate footprint. Um, and, and like you said, you're a real estate person. There's a lot of folks that can offer a managed services type of, of approach so that it takes the onus off of you. You offer the services, you provide more value to your tenant in, in this, this strange and, and competitive time and let the folks who design, build, and manage networks do exactly what they what they do. And, yeah, so Jim, ma what, manage services, right? So t tell me your process of what that would be. 
and you know, is there a lot of out of pocket costs? Can you amortize these costs? Like, how do you make it, you know, feasible uh, as far as dollars is concerned? Okay, well, good question. And just like anything else, there's options to either buy everything outright and do it yourself or uh, rely on a managed service partner. And Geoverse can be considered a managed service partner. Um, and I think the I think the equation, John, that if someone like you were going to be considering this for one of your buildings would be, okay, do I have an IT resource that I can dedicate to this right now? And typically, um, they're the headcount for IT guys, um, even though it may be there, they're really hard to find, and they're really hard to find a good one these days. And then finding one with cellular networking and radio experience, you're you're probably um, you know the odds are that's going to be very difficult. So um, we're we're taking the approach where. Um, we can we can work in a number of different ways, including a full subscription offering for this sort of service, managed service, provide all the equipment, everything you need, have a company like Brendan's come in there and install it and just pay a monthly fee, um, perhaps work with the operator to do different thing. And we're taking away, demystifying the complexity, giving you a portal so that you see all your data, you're able to manage all your data, but we're doing the rest in the background. Um, but again, that's an option, um, but there's many ways to deal with this right now. That part of the ecosystem is pretty mature. I, I'm going to ask Jim another question because every time I ask one, he says, good question. He makes me feel good. So I'm going to ask him the next question. So, so Jim, obviously I get it, but my tenants, like why will they care? Get, like I get it right now. It's going to be more flexible for us. You know, it looks like we have to do less work deploying this. You know, if we have kiosks or events or, or different things that we want to deploy in the building in different spaces, it seems like it's easier to turn on and make it work. But, you know, and what I was told is, you know, if you're in multiple buildings as a tenant, this is a much more secure way to transmit amongst buildings. So that, that was something I was told that I thought, OK, that's a really good thing to tell one of my tenants. What are some other things we should tell our tenants on why? Great question, John. Better than good. I love it. Um, well, I think I think I mean you kind of answered your own question in a lot of ways, and that this is a this is a, a new utility for them. It's a fourth utility that provides them uh, with a level of security, gives them um, kind of a more reliable, uh, more you know. I, I mentioned security. But then also, if you apply security to the voice, let's say you're you're concerned about policy and um, and you need to have even you're in, you're in a financial industry and you need to have even your voice you need to have even policy behind your voice. You can you can create those sorts of policies, those sorts of cure, security enforcement that you previously couldn't do uh, with a Wi-Fi network or even with bringing in your own cellular network from the outside. Um, but if you go, let's say you go down the warehouse, let's say you're, you're a just in time manufacturer, you're in warehousing and you're bringing in some of the robotic things that Oren talked about, or you're now, because, because the world is paperless, you're using VR headsets instead of carrying around floor plans and things like that. Um, you, you basically had to rely on a wired connection or something from the outside to make that happen. Now you have the ability to make this happen and I'm gonna use the word 5G like speeds, but faster with better quality than you ever did before. And I hope that answers your question, but there's a number of application roads we can go down. Yeah, no, um, let, me, let me jump in for one second and give you a real world example. So say the, the uh, TI that you've given some new tenant has been done or they've taken the space exactly as it is and now they get ready to move in and they get their it guys cranked up and they call verizon and say okay verizon we have uh, 75 desks we got to wire up we have um you know uh, an it closet we have to have um this would obviate all of that would give you sort of instant ability to have everybody come in put their laptops on the desk and be ready to work that single day. 
So that's right, that's Rich. And then, and then on on top of that, instead of having to create wiring in a building you're converting to a warehouse or manufacturing, you can do all this autonomous stuff. Um, you know, that's pick and pack, whatever you're doing with that same layer that you're that that you just mentioned. So it's right. it's a multiple play. And it's so and it's, and it's secure and it's really secure. I mean, the, that, right. that is like paramount with everything going on right now. So. Yeah. So yeah, we were also doing a story of all these stuff. Go ahead, Brent. One quick thing to leapfrog off in a in a manufacturing environment, you don't even have to have to have the automation to see some value here, um, because we deploy infrastructure. We we've recabled um, manufacturing spaces, and the the cost to retool that when especially today you need to be flexible to change with the times and and deploy new equipment and recable. You can save a a, a fortune by being able to do that dynamically and you have to worry less about a fork truck or something running into a jack and destroying your infrastructure and having to wait for somebody and having a line down for something as silly as that so it's even beyond just an automation play or, or that forward thinking automation it can have a real impact for manufacturers today that are not automated yet right so if you've got mixed use real estate john where you've got lower level is retail and the second story up is a carpeted office um, you can now give them the ability to run their terminals. That's been discussed a couple of times, but to run their their uh, credit card terminals off this network's very securely. All right, so that's what we can do. And then, Oren, I got a question for you right after this. That's what we can do. How does it save money for the tenant? Is this a more expensive proposition or is this a less expensive proposition in the long run? Who wants to take that? I thought, did, were you asking Oren or did you? No, that was a uh, Brendan uh, Jim say, question. Who wants to take so you, that? Guys, you guys are selling this stuff. <laughs> I'm, I'm hyping it. Go ahead, Brendan. I'll let you take it first. I think it, it allows you to offer an ease of use and uh, um, ease of deployment for your new tenants as you bring folks in. If you're the one-stop shop for these things, you can leverage some economies of scale for them by by being that single point of contact. It'll it avoids them or decreases the number of vendors that they'll need to bring in as they move into your space. So it lowers the bar of entry of, of moving from wherever they may be and established to your space as a landlord. What about monthly costs for the the frequency? Is that is that cheaper? Well the, the frequency doesn't come with a cost. That okay. that is that that part is free. But I think the way you got to look at this, John, is you got to say, okay, where is Wi-Fi not good enough? um for whatever application that is and if you're if you have a high speed ethernet or a high speed fiber deployment can this replace that high speed fiber deployment and then getting your phones and other devices to work on it is kind of kind of the triple play if you will for for what and we're will, talking will this ultimately replace DAS systems or no yeah I, I i mean first of all you know DAS is you know is it industry kind of um, term for uh, an, an antenna network that basically amplifies signal from cellular carriers. The traditional DAS, the CBRS network can pencil out as low as in the 70 cents a square foot arena, where I don't, I don't know, Brendan, you know DAS, but when, by, the, by the time you're done with DAS, it's significantly, you know, clo probably close to $3 a square foot in that neighborhood, uh, high twos in there. A lot, depends, it, a lot depends on, on your use case and, and where you're at. So, gotcha. Um, gotcha. so, so I think there'll be buildings that traditional DAS and CBRS will coexist because at the end of the day, this, this could be capacity for carriers. It could be a lot of things. Gotcha. It, will, it will unlock a lot of buildings that couldn't afford that higher cost of DAS for that just that one use case, but you 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 quadruple the use cases you can use this for, um, as we just mentioned and covered some of the stuff. So it is uh, it 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 is a DAS kind of alternative, uh, but it will be even more so as time goes on. So that's that that's good. So Oren, we mentioned 5G before. Is this something building owners need to be thinking about in a very concerned way? Is this going to replace Wi-Fi? Like, what's your thoughts on 5G? So, yeah, I, I 
5G is an interesting topic, but I think people should think about it less in do I need 5G and more into what am I trying to achieve here? What am I trying to do here? Because I'm not going to name names, but there's a lot of people out there hyping 5G and selling 5G, but you're not buying 5G. You're buying, you're, you're basically enabling use cases. And every single use case that we just talked about till now, all the way from the robots, the security, wireless security cameras, the door locks, the sensors, digital signage, emergency, emergency communication systems, everything um, that we talked about works really well on LT, on 4G, and, and uh, performs really well. The devices are out there. Um, and I'm not ragging on 5G, but I'm just, I just want to say that don't, you don't need 5G. You need to address these use cases that you're looking to address. So again, everything we talked about works on 4G. 5G is coming. Not only that, but but um, CBRS will work on 5G. It's basically, like I said, it's a spectrum. And that same spectrum in the Angle Alliance, we've already put together the specs and I've seen it working in labs. And there are certain um, uh, trials with 5G working, but you need specific devices. And, um, and, and again, it's coming. But if you want to deploy something in the next six to 12 months, my personal recommendation is look at the use cases um are they solved by by lte uh, the price points the price points will be lower the delivery will be faster and after that you could totally evolve to 5g now i will say will in a few years you'll be able to walk into a room and start swifting up screens like minority report with a 5g network and and do doing stuff like that yeah cool i mean that's gonna happen 5g will get here i'm not i'm not saying it's not gonna get here but today um Personally, I mean, I would say focus on what you're trying to get done and and uh, and you'll probably find out that all of it can be done today with uh, 4G, with CBRS on 4G running on LT. Yeah, I remember when 4G came out, it was the same thing, right? Again, this is a process and I guess there's low, mid and high band, right? So I guess it's, it depends when and how that all gets to in our buildings because it's going to have to. And we're going to have to think about that, right? Because you know, can it pass through the glass, the walls? Do you need extra sensors? There's all sorts of other conversations that are going to need to go on. Right. And, and I will say that, and, and again, I want to go back to say that CBRS can bring you to 5G. We'll bring 5G into your building. Um, and that's a great thing because, again, you're not, like we said, the, these operators paid tens of billions of dollars for 5G spectrum. You're yeah, basically be being told secure? now. Will that help the security of the network being a combination of, of that or no? 5G did add some security layers, but um, right now we're really happy again with the security level of 4G and what we're seeing with LTE, but 5G does add some security levels, but it mostly where it really does well is the latency that Jim talked about. Um, when you get into these crazy scenarios where, where self-driving cars or remote operations or, 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 and again, we don't know yet what the use cases where 5G were really shy because they're not here yet, but uh, it's kind of more of a, build it and they will come and that worked with 4G as well. Hey, now we have like, we're ubiquitously connected all the time. We could do that before 3G. Just gotta but hope when you get again, like the these cases will get here. But there, there's something behind this curtain because everyone's spending a lot of time and money on it. So we're- Yeah, and, and John, there, yeah. John, there's tons of marketing around 5G, but I think for guys like you, there's gonna be a private 5G and a public 5G and you know, the public 5G is gonna be somewhat out of your control. You know, your your smartphones are gonna be um, faster and um, you'll be able to watch videos in a more prolific way when you're out on the street. Yeah. But, but the private 5G, you know, that's gonna take a different course. And I think if 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 you, you know, a lot, there's a lot of unknowns as, as Oren said, and there's, most of the use cases that you think you need 5G for, you can accomplish with this. But but IoT is going to be where the private 5G, um, where you're going to start seeing the kind of the technology advancement um, is on that private 5G side. So um, a lot to stay tuned for, but this band will get you there. John, the, the analogy I use is like we didn't know that Uber and Lyft were coming when we 4G yeah. came about, you'll yeah. see things coming that we go, well, boy, that makes a lot of sense, but we didn't know that was coming with 5G and these things. So we are at about uh, 2.45, um, and we've got a ton of questions. So I'd like to jump in, John, and we can you can feed these to whomever you like, 
um, some really good ones. And it looks like these are coming in mo most cases from real estate people. Um, one of the questions it looks like that, I'm not sure who this came from, but is there a max power restriction on what you could do with private LTE? So um, one of you guys, Jim or uh, Brendan, want to handle that one? I mean, yeah, there is. Uh, when you get indoors, there's a there's a max power of what equates to one watt from the radio, and there's certain height restrictions. Um, and that's that's actually a good thing because that means that these networks aren't going to be interfering with each other. Um, outdoor, there's there's a separate restriction for outdoor. It's more powerful, not powerful enough for the carriers, but still more powerful. Um, so I'd say, uh, I, I mean, that's my answer right there. I don't know if anyone wants to. Brandon, do you want to add anything to that or no? Yeah, I, I think Jim, Jim hit the nail on the head from the from the technical perspective. Um, from an indoor perspective, it, it's plenty for what you need indoor uh, to support some really dense use cases in terms of number of devices you can connect. And from a from a typical campus environment, um, it's plenty powerful enough for that. Like Jim said, it's not. It's not what you're seeing on, on top of a cell tower, like what the carriers are used to doing with their LTE networks. But if you're trying to control the LTE on a campus, it's great for a uh, small cell type of application. Yeah, that's what but, I guess Apple's deployed it's very on good. their campus uh, from what I, what I heard. So what's the next one, uh, Rich? Um, do most users today support private LTE native or do they need to add a dongle? I'm I don't not know if sure. Using probably one. devices. I let, let let's assume that he meant devices here. When when um, you want to connect a device, so right now we're looking at over 200 different devices. We've seen that that support. Um, and like I said, we have all these laptops coming off. But the typical laptop that um, people are working right now at home, if it's not the latest one from from Dell or Lenovo, it probably does not support right now um, CBRS. But again, the, we're getting more and more, like I said, we have 200 right now, more and more coming out. Like you said, the new iPhones, Google Pixels, Samsung Galaxies, um, LGs all support uh, CBRS. If your device does not support it, yes, you would need a dongle, a USB dongle would work uh, to basically enable that radio band. What's cool here is this is basically, a, 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 a I'm trying not to say the acronym, but a 3GPP, an LP, it's, it's basically a standard um, LTE band here. So you're adding a band 48, it's called. And so it's a stand, all you need to do is add that band and give your device access to that band and you're good to go. But I don't want to oversimplify that you yeah. will need in some cases uh, a gateway or a dongle to get uh, access to it. But, but, hey, Rich, so the, the newer laptops that are going to be coming out, I are going to, you're going to start seeing laptop. And I think this is where this question was if it was a dongle. Right, right now, most laptops don't have this capability, but I think some of the newer ones are going to have it, including Dell's. The Apple iPad has it, a bunch of Android uh, uh, tablets have it. Um, and one of the one of the really, really big use cases right now is providing uh, students on the other side of the homework gap with a hotspot so that they can, you know, do homework and get broadband. And so the 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 ones the school districts and the cities that are doing this and using CBRS to do it are actually providing the students with not only that laptop but the little hotspot and it most times it's not a dongle it's a little like MiFi device um, that so you get Wi-Fi out from the computer to the to there and then back but you get that strong CBRS signal to send to the student's house and in my work with the discussions with T-Mobile, I think they've got a device from Insego, um, a MiFi device that actually does have CBRS. So, um, yeah, that's exactly. Good one. That's Jim, one of them. I'd like to stay with you for this. Um, can you discuss carrier roaming onto and from CBRS? Will UEs require dual SIMs to operate on commercial network and CBRS network? How does, this is a lot. Well, How does yeah, I mean, it's from one right, network to right. another? Right now, Geoverse can do this in either a single SIM mode or a dual SIM mode is the short answer. But Geoverse is unique in that we're, we're not unique, but we're, we're different than someone putting up a network by themselves because we have that carrier code we bring along with it. And so Oren could probably address 
the CBRS Alliance, or now the Ongo Alliance, offers a different sort of code. And you could probably say where you're at with that code, Warren, um, the shared HNI. Right, and, and not to get really into it too much, I'm, but, but bottom line, um, dual SIM works, and also there's something today called an eSIM. So you don't have a physical SIM, you basically have a software SIM instead of using those, those small physical SIMs. So we're also enabling those to support uh, neutral host. So there was a question about data. How granular is this data? Does this provide for any type of location-based service solution, such as crowd tracking or geofencing? Well, yeah, I mean, it, it, the, the beauty of a network like this is it's private and you, you can integrate uh, APIs from you know, third-party applications into the network to do that kind of thing. Um, and Brendan, I don't know if you have any of those in deployment right now, any geofencing, but one of the one of the areas that uh, that we're seeing with geofencing is on construction job site, where you want to make sure those tools don't leave the site. So you kind of geofence the tools and that sort of thing. But as indoor starts opening up, you'll see more and more of this sort of these sort of application layers uh, come on top of this. It's sort of cool. It's like Salesforce mm -hmm. in the App Store, or Apple Phone right. in the App Store. Yeah. I mean, it's unlimited, right? I mean, when you really think about it, and that's why I think it's important for your industry to be use case oriented. Because at the end of the day, like as an owner, you know, I, I don't know what you know, unless you tell me why and give me a use case, it's hard to make a decision on why you need it. So, and I, I think you've done a tremendous job in that uh, today. Is there more questions, Rich, in, from yep. the crowd? Plenty, plenty more, John. People yeah. were really interested in what, what we had to say here. So. Um, this one is interesting. Please explain two-way radio communication option. Um, in other words, in a hotel setting, um, can I use this as a, um, a panic button for the maids in that situation? How would that work? Brendan, you so want to take that? Yeah, did someone from Geoverse ask that question? Because uh, we, we happen to have an application or an installation where that's going on. So, no, I think really that was far. Tony this time, Jim. <laughs> To show in the audience. So, so we we have installations at um, at hotels combined with casinos, and they call uh, housekeeping uh, back of house services. And one of the applications that's being used is not only for this push to talk radio uh, element that you can use over this, but also there's an application that allows the maid to, to press a panic button if something's going wrong. From that same application, you can also create a situation where let's say the maid is speaking one language and the, uh, the manager is speaking another, they can translate that language from one language to another with this application. So they call that back of house applications. In that That's interesting. That's a really interesting use case. Um, so Brendan, maybe you wanna take this one. Um, this one, the question is, can this replace cable internet provider cabling to the rooms and is it all handled in the entrance room? So in other words, I guess what they're asking is, could you do streaming in a hotel using this network? Yes. Mm -hmm. Yes, you, you, you definitely can, but uh, kind of leapfrogging a little bit back to, to the question Jim just addressed and also what John was asking about use case specific, that's one where the, imagination that the integrator has as well as the the owner of the facility has that's what limits you there because it's all api driven it's all about the creativity you want to bring to market and to solve the problems you're seeing and one of those being that that streaming service so to a degree it can replace the uh the the, the hard infrastructure going into the room to the to the tv or a lot of these these newer hotels have have smart infrastructure, whether it's a tethered tablet there to help control your smart room. There, there's a lot of neat stuff at, at, that's being deployed in these scenarios, but yeah, it can severely decrease the infrastructure cost of, of deploying wired infrastructure throughout the facility. So you, you enter your head end, that's essentially the last place that the two room cabling goes, everything else is, is to your uh, private LTE radio network, and then it's an air interface to whatever device you want to put on, whether it's that's streaming it. devices, whether it's that's the UK's gym referenced point of sale for 
for your uh, for your food and beverage folks. So it really allows you to keep everything on on your network and let the guest network do just what the guest network needs to do. Instead yeah, Brendan, Brendan, Brendan's given you an example from a hotel, but where where we're seeing, I think, with with that that question was, can you basically become a WISP for a multi-tenant facility? And where we're seeing that play out with CBRS, oh, wireless ISP. So there replace a service provider. <laughs> a service provider. Someone that provides a high-speed internet. Right, so thank you, thank you. Um, so no we're acronyms. Yeah, I know. I but he but Oren started with three GPP, so I thought this no, was. A he didn't. I had to stop. Broke us. So where we're seeing this play out, Rich, is if if you're familiar with older apartments which are probably not in new york city and more of the garden style the ones built like mid 90s or before before don't have fiber going to all these buildings and so they have a difficult time getting you know and most of these most of the tenants in those buildings don't aren't even cable subscribers anymore they just want to use the internet so they have a tough time getting an internet connection they have a tough time you know getting a lot of things that we take for granted and you can't eat the, those buildings aren't wired that way so we're seeing a move to use cbrs as the as the um as the connectivity link to enable not only you know high speed internet service but also create amenities that are more available for more modern buildings but you could use cbrs for that you can use it to uh put in surveillance cameras on the property and that without ripping up the concrete so again it's like shot a shot spotter in other words shot all that stuff like that. all that stuff in these older buildings that didn't have fiber coming to them and frankly the fiber providers aren't interested in going into these places and ripping up the concrete and doing what they need to do unless they have to so that's where we're seeing that play out no, it's it's good. Good. Jim, just to go back to one of the cord things cutting. it's good go ahead. Sorry. it's good for cord cutting that's right. That's right. Right, Jim. This plays off on one of the things you answered before with the hotel. And uh, but is in your own office building, can SIP extensions be used to utilize each person's cell phone? So in other words, you could make the cell phones of the tenants be a uh, a spot on the PBX in that That's setting. Right. right. You can you can use their cell phone. And this is I talked about policy before. You, instead of having a desk phone, you can use that cell that cell phone as your as your PBX number as well. And yep. so um, you can you can do that today. And if you're in a you know situation where either you have policies you need to enforce down to a voice label or just a convenient thing, that's one of the things CBRS. And you don't have to do an app for it. You can use a native dialer that's available on the smartphone. So and this you know, the one way these offices, back. Rich, hold on a second. The way these offices are going to get redesigned for post-COVID, that seems like an interesting thing to have, right? Because you're not really going to have a desk. You're going to have right. more collaborative spaces. So that's uh, that can play right into this. Right. So and we're going to go. And Brendan's an expert this. on this too, right now. So we're going to leave this with uh, <laughs> a, a, a uh, high five to Oren here. Someone asked. Um, is there a document to give us full understanding on what you gentlemen are presenting? And I'd like to, to suggest that in the document we will send out with this video and audio portion, we will be sending out the um, CBRS for Dummies that the Ongo Alliance just put out. Um, everyone will get a copy of that. And we are now just about out of time. So I want to thank first and foremost, uh, John Schultz for for you know, poking me and getting this going. John, you did a wonderful job today. Uh, question, I hope we answered your questions. You did, you did, except you still got to learn how to not use acronyms, but that's okay. We're, we're getting better at it. <laughs> uh, yeah, and we need a symbol for acronym with a line through it. So yeah. thank you to all of you who sponsored today. Uh, Brendan with ANS Advanced Network Services, um, Oren with Ongo Alliance, and Jim with Geoverse. Thank you all for participating, and thank you all who listened in today. We had a great crowd with us today, and thank you again. All of you will be getting this within 48 hours um, of this uh, broadcast, and we are done now with the uh, webinar. Thank you for attending. Thanks, Thanks for having me. Appreciate yeah. it. Thanks, everybody. Thanks.